we, uh, in talking about the day that we're living in and the church triumphant or the triumphant church, we know that if we are on the offensive coming against the gates of hell, which we are continually, um, and those gates sometimes seem very formidable, very much as strongholds where they, and, and the enemy is wise, that's why God says be wise as a serpent but harmless as a dove. So there are strategies, there are things that he does through thoughts and things he imparts to men to get them to do his bidding. I'm speaking of the enemy, or the devil. And, uh, but God has a strategy above all that. If the enemy knew everything, some people think, well, he you have the knowledge of God on one side. He knows all this good and the enemy. He's like a co-equal, but on the evil side, no. No, he's a created being. God is not. He doesn't have full knowledge. God does. Because if he had known, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory, Paul wrote. So he's uh, only this big. <laughs> God is this big. How big is God? Some kids said, as big as the sky. You know, he's, he's a great and mighty God. And so, but we still have a warfare. We still have battles that we face. I'm sure not, none, nobody here had any issues, nothing. All week, week was just perfect, right? Like Lake Placid, it was just like no ripples, no nothing, right? No, no waves, no crashing shore, sound, no. Eh, well, okay, maybe I am talking to the right group, okay. But yeah, life just, some people just graciously say, well, it has its ups and downs. Yeah. I did a character one time when I said ups and downs made me think of it. And I scared a bunch of kids and I never did it again. I dressed up during a Halloween costume harvest type festival we had way back when we did all those dress ups. Uh, Karen might remember. And the kids all played, but the Young adults and teens dressed up for Halloween, but not in anything scary. They would pick a theme like a Disney theme or a, a cartoon theme, and they would dress up. And so, um, but as an adult, I came in dressed up this one time. Now, these people have lived and grown, and they have kids of their own. But back when these little tykes were running around, I thought, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to put on a character. And uh, kind of speaking of life having its ups and downs, uh, I played Mr. Upson R. Downs. That was his name, Upson R. Downs. And I had a face, I, I figured out a way to fry, frown, can you say it? frown and smile at the same time. I practiced it, and I did that, and I, I, and I kind of dressed one way on one side of my body and one way on the other, and I would walk this ups and downs, this thing. And I came in, and the kids, some of us heard screaming, crying. I said, that lasted five minutes, and I thought, forget that idea. I spent all this time trying to develop this character, and it was just like a wash in five minutes. I remember this girl just like shriek and claw and grab at the leg of her mother. And, and I went, oh, this is not working out too good. <laughs> so it was panic. Just turned... Pastor Tony loose among the kids and see what kind of terror comes. <laughs> uh, so I'm just saying, life may give you all of that, but don't you pick up on that. Let's be, and here finally, yes, to my message. It's about consistency. It's about uh, being very continual or, as we said earlier, regular. That beats irregularity any day. You know? And... <laughs> And being, uh, it's really a cure for criticism. And what do I mean by a cure for criticism? Well, in the heat of our battle, and we'll have them as Christians, we'll have just natural events that happen that, that kind of pull us aside or trouble us. We have people directly, or maybe even just indirectly, criticize, pick, poke, say things, you know, whether it's behind your back or to your face, or uh, like the scribes and Pharisees, they always tried to trick Jesus in, with his words. You know, they, they, they would think, they spent all their days thinking of ways they could trap this guy. Because they, you know, he was putting, truth puts a lot of pressure out there. And ultimately, you know, 
Men love darkness more than they love light. That's what the word tells us. It almost goes without saying. You know, we would have figured that out anyway because people, they run from it. They hide under rocks. They, they would rather stay there. And when God comes to judge, they want those rocks to fall on them. They just can't handle that. So in light of that, when you just, sometimes you just are, and uh, people just may back off or criticize. So what's the cure for criticism? Meaning, how do you not get affected and you hold the course and be steady, be um, the person God's called you to be? Well, those things will come against all of us. No temptation has come to any man that's to, to any of us that's not frequented on your brother or your sister, people around the world, or whether you live, you know, with all the uh, posh trimmings of the elite or whatever. There's going to be things that, that hit. 2 Timothy 3.14. Paul writes this, But you must, must continue. You must continue in the things which you have learned and heard, heard and learned, and then be assured. Let's see. You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Peter also said, though you be established in the present truth, I'm here to stir you up by putting you in remembrance of those things. This is where Paul said, you've learned these things from me. Don't waver from them. Continue in them. There's a saying, uh, if any of you took music when you're in school, maybe if, even if you didn't, you probably heard the phrase, practice makes perfect. A lot of us just teachers will use that. Practice makes perfect. And that, that's a truism. I agree. It's very true. Uh, practice, and later in life, this was from a vocal coach. We purchased some tapes from them. It was very useful. Uh, it would help you with your range and everything. They were a very, very gifted couple that put together these tapes. And I remember something he said on that in his teaching. He said, be careful how you practice, though. Do it the right way continually. Continue, you know, if you're going to do something regularly, frequently, making a habit out of it, these things are good, but make sure you're practicing with this idea in mind that it's practicing makes permanent, not just perfect. And that kind of outweighs the other one, doesn't it? Because you can practice something and think you have it right, and it's, it's kind of bent a little bit, it's off a little bit, and then it becomes that habit, and that it, it's in there, and then you realize, oh, that whole time I've been singing that note, I've been singing the wrong note, <laughs> then it would be hard to break it, wouldn't it? Now that's speaking of music or something. But so in life, uh, I had another instructor that I heard, and I thought, I'll take his advice on this. He said, if you say something, do something 19 times in a row, it'll just be a habit after that. You almost don't have to think about it. I mean, you will, but it's, you, you don't work at it. All the labor, the sweat is gone. You just, boom, there it is, and it comes right back to you. So uh, one day, Rochelle, when she was, I don't know, she was still grade school, mid middle of grade school years, uh, her most difficult class was math. She just, and to this day, she's not a fan of math. So I'm saying this to say, I had just heard that about saying something 19 times. She was struggling with long division. How many of you like math? I see all those hands. <laughs> Two. <laughs> and so uh, I, I enjoy it. Uh, some of that high-end stuff I've forgotten long ago. It's like, whew, it's uh, been 50 years ago since I really had to apply a lot of that stuff. So she was struggling with long division. I said, where, I found out where she was struggling, what she couldn't remember. And so I thought, okay, you multiply, 
you subtract and bring down the next number. How many of you remember that? Now I'm really challenging everyone. You do the multiplication from the outside of the box, you know. What will go into that? So it's multiply, and then, then you put that number underneath, draw a line, you subtract, you bring down the next number. That little subtract and bring down the next number, subtract, bring down the next number, subtract. I said, look at me. <laughs> Multiply, subtract, and bring down the next number. And we, she said it real slow, and then she said it about third and fourth time, and then pretty soon we just kept saying it. Multiply, subtract, bring down the next number. Multiply. So I'm not going to make you go through the 19, but she went through the 19. And to this day, if you would ask her, what is her favorite subject in school? She would say, well, not math. It's still not math. <laughs> I didn't win the whole, you know, didn't get the grand champion award on that. But, but as soon as you, she would say something about math, and you ask her what she learned or whatever, she'd say, well, I know this. <laughs> you multiply, you subtract, and you bring down the next number. It's in there. Because she said it 19 times. My point in that and everything else is this practice doesn't always necessarily make perfect, but it makes permanent. And so when, when we do something, and so let me just say this. Because God is regular, he's consistent, he continually does things just, a, doesn't he just do things a certain way? He's not different today than he was 10 years ago in your life, is he? Did he change any of his word? No. Did he, um, did you find him in a different mood this morning than he was 18 months ago? In a different mood? Now, he created the seasons, but he's not a seasonal God. You go to a Farm and Home or Big R, or one of these stores around here, they'll have a seasonal section. You can go and buy clothing or you can buy whatever for that season. And then the next season comes, there's something else on the shelf or on the display. There's seasonal, th and God's created season. That's good. He created, but he's not a seasonal God. He's not like, okay, this is the way God is in the winter. <laughs> but I like him better in the summer. <laughs> I do not mean, you know. I got a moth flying through. <laughs> Welcome to our service. <laughs> and in other words, he's consistent. He's continual. He's the same. Thank God that he never changes. Whew. Because of his mercies that are unfailing, that means they're, right, they're the same from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. What's that tell you about him? Because of those mercies that are unfailing, you know what the rest of the lament, I think it's out of lamentation, says, you are not consumed. <laughs> oh, man. What if God woke up and said, man, I, I mean, I've had it to hear. <laughs> what if he ever, if you heard him say, I'm just about, and it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, then, you know, yeah, then we would be consumed. He could just go, bing, and the whole universe would go way over that way somewhere. It wouldn't take much. So, it's kind of sometimes a humorous way to say it, but with all sobriety, I'm just trying to point to the fact that because God is faithful, he's consistent in all that he does, that just encourages me to be, to be that way, to, you know. Now, am I working on it still? Yeah. Are you working? Sure. Do we want to put that? What do you want to instill in your children and your grandchildren and those around you? You know, those of you that work in the labor force, even if you're not in management, you just uh, have coworkers. If they're, if they're the employees of a business are there one day and you don't know if they're going to be there the next day, whoa, what's that? You can't bank on anything. Confidence in an unfaithful man is like having a broken tooth or your foot's out of joint. Talk about ups and our downs. You know, I mean, yeah, you would be we would look that way. So Christianity can't be that way. We have to be like God is, is our example. Be frequent, be regular. You know, middle of the road sometimes sounds like a terrible, terrible place, but just middle of the road, just, you know, 
Dullesville, boredom. <laughs> when you're a kid growing up, you want to try out way over there, and you want to go way over here and zig and zag. I understand that. But boy, middle of the road is a lot safer. <laughs> and uh, it means you've got a handle on it, and you're focusing. And so to be where we need to be when criticism comes, we need to be able to handle that criticism. If we're consistent like he is, then we're not going to waver. We're going to be established and strengthened in those things, even though we're persecuted. Some of the greatest times that the church ever grew was during persecution because they just let, let their acts be sharpened. They just honed up. They just said, no. <laughs> and they let, like Jesus said, let your no be no. Let your yes be yes. What's that? Nothing glorious, nothing glamorous. We're not talking rapture of the church and the soon coming king. Hallelujah. And, get, and you know, we can get lathered up about that. But this is a message of being consistent. That doesn't sound like a fireball message, but it, it'll burn right through like a laser right through the doors and the gates of hell into the courts of the enemy because it'll just make what the psalmist says, why do the heathen rage <laughs> and they imagine a vain thing? It's because where God's coming from, it's like he's drawing the line and it just causes some people. <coughs> and so the church will catch the flack. We'll catch the criticism. We'll catch those things. So I'm saying, just be sweet. Smile and say, no, thank you, or whatever it is. But just be steady and know that as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. I don't need some big audience. I just need audience with the king. Don't look for some fanfare, big pat on the back. The world's not necessarily going to give it to you. If you have too many friends, I mean, that might not be a problem, but, uh, but no one ever says anything wrong about you, then you might <laughs> think, what camp am I in if it doesn't stir up a little something? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So you must continue in the things which you have learned and heard and been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them. Also in James 1, 21 through 25, you know, I picked a couple of verses out here. And I, have you done this before? You look at the one after it, and you look at the one before it, and you say, well, that's a good one, too. And, well, th well, that's real good. You know, and so, so this verse is kind of one of those. It's like four or five in a row here you go together very well. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the imparted... No. I said it wrong because I kept telling myself this morning that it's not the imparted, it's the implanted word. Implanted. Big difference, isn't there? You know, God can impart something to us. You hear a prophetic word, you hear a good message, something gets imparted. Have laying on hands ministry, great impartation. We use that word a lot in Christendom, don't we? Impartation. That's good. I don't want to foo-foo that at all. But on top of that, in light of that, I like the implanted word. If it's imparted, that sounds like sautéed in butter. You know, it's gooey on the outside, but it's, you, know, you want it all the way in. You want it. <laughs> i got crazy ways. <laughs> the cooks are all <laughs> chuckling here in the house. <laughs> but... You, you want it just infused, the implanted and not just the imparted. They're similar, but I think this one's a little, well, that means that's what's going to grow up if it's implanted, which is able to save your souls. Next verse. But then we're to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We say that, we know that verse, but with that, it's the doing that actually is part of that implantation, isn't it? If we just hear it, a lot of us have heard a lot of word along the way. I had heard it for 19 years before I became a Christian, and then uh, it opened up, I became born again, and then you were gladly a doer, right? A doer of the word. And it's the doers that will be blessed in their deeds. 
But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, and he observes himself, goes his way, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Uh, I find that with the grandkids a lot. <laughs> oh, man. They'll say something, they'll nod. Yep, okay, Papa. You know, they're hearing, they're looking at me, you know, and psh, I'll go right out and do what I said not to do. <laughs> it's just a straight way they forget. I said, look at me, you know. Now, they're not looking at a mirror, but they're getting full instruction. Example of <laughs> that one was just this morning. We have the, uh, the boys, we call them. The boys are with us till Wednesday. So they're in the back now, hopefully not tying up anybody. or <laughs> Cowboys and Indians and no, or whatever. You got to be careful what you say, even that like that, you know, out in the world that <laughs> people take offense at anything. Well, you know what? I'm going to offend somehow, somewhere, somebody. So I'm just going to be me. And I'll make apologies where I need to make apologies. But that being said, the boys um, were running and jumping, and we're, we're trying to get them dressed, you know. And they're anywhere but holding still, where, you know. And so none of you know. Yeah, you, yes, you do. <laughs> and so they were, uh, so I had them right together in the bedroom, and we're all trying to get dressed. I said, now, boys. And they were just like Mexican jumping beans. There's another. <laughs> I'm getting trouble for that. <laughs> I'm going to get hung today. I'll give it up, Tony. And so they were like jumping jacks. And I, if I've offended someone named Jack, I'm sorry. <laughs> they were all over. And, and they were running. And they were on it. And I said, boys, right here. Look at Paw Paw. They call me Paw Paw. So I said, look at Paw Paw. Now, whose house is this? It's your house. I said, okay, good. You got that. I said, now, I said, I want to tell you something. Is there any running and jumping when you're inside? You're just going wild. No. I said, okay, you got it. Victory no sooner turns like this, he jumps in the air. He runs about four or five feet over towards the door, turns around, gives me a thumbs up like, I got it. Bing! He jumps and ran. He's like, what manner of man was he? What was that? That was like two hours ago. You got to be kidding me. I heard every word. Thanks, Paul. You know, bing! Thanks, I needed that. Well, I mean, we laugh, and then we, we'll go out and we'll go, you know what? I kind of acted like victory <laughs> when I did that last week, didn't I? Or I kind of, you know, we'll have our little thing. God will say something. And it's like, by golly, I did. I, did I? I guess I really didn't hear that very well, did I? I got to get that. Instead of it just imparted, I need it implanted. How do you do that? Multiply subtract, and bring down the next number. That's how you do it. <laughs> like 19 times. You just tell yourself. You do, do, you, you, do you make things habitual. You, you just do it. And although it sounds like oh, monotonous or drudgery, I'm telling you because it makes permanent. And if you work from God's word doing that, you just get this thing. What do you see when you see people like the Allens? Leon Van Royen, the other leaders. So you see this consistent, this, this thing that's just, it's just hammered in there. It's something, when I said hammered, listen to this. You know, God puts gold in us. You know, he, our faith, when it's tried, is more precious than gold. He's wanting that same quality in us. But you know, <laughs> to take it a little further, what I realized one time, he wants this gold in us. He took the gold back in the days of Moses when they collected the, spe the jewels and all the special, like silver, gold, and bronze to make the tabernacle and then the temple. All that that went into it and this making of the body of Christ and 
And so this gold, it's tried in fire. So you've gone through the fire, and this gold comes forth more precious, this faith more precious than gold. And then you know what? He did to make the, like the candlestick and the things of the holiest of holies. You look at that, and it says, they were formed and made by the craftsmen and by the special you know, artisans of the day. And the candlestick was made of beaten gold. They formed it and forged it and beat it into place. I think, wouldn't it be enough to be tried in fire, to come forth pure as gold, and then you're going to beat me? <laughs> Beaten, formed, and fashioned, like, uh, doom, 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 doom. you know, again and again and again. A wham, a wham. I'm saying that to hopefully make the medicine go down a little easier, but with criticism, with the things that happen, with temptation, whatever, by you holding steady, taking those, those blows, those knocks, some of them correction from God. There's not enough can be said about continuance, being continual, and being constant. Here's what I wrote down. The cure for criticism, things coming against you, is to be constant, continual, with an added occasional course correction. You won't have to grind your wheels to a halt before you're at the edge of the cliff and hard right, hard left to get out of a difficulty or danger. If you make a, and, and we're doing that, make a habit and a pattern of doing it God's way continually and looking for those opportunities to apply God's word to your life and in situations, then along the way, there will be adjustments. I get adjusted frequently, sometimes from grandkids. <laughs> but it, then it's just small course corrections and not major, you know, moves away from some fiasco. And so this is, this is important to realize in, uh, in finishing these verses. Let me come back. For if any of you be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's uh, like a natural man observing his face in a mirror. He observes and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Verse 25. But he or she who looks into the perfect law of liberty... And what? Continues in it. Continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. I want to be blessed in what I do. And as you frequently and continue to do those things that we know to do, we're setting an example for others. You're making it almost where it's just second nature becoming first nature, and the end result of that, nothing but blessed. I, I don't know any other way to live, do you? I, I want to see a mark made. Now, when uh, I saw this lady one time, it was probably on the Golf Channel. I don't get that right now. I guess I could look it up or something, but used to watch a lot more of that. And I saw this person out there, and I would watch them, and they had a line of balls somewhere on the green, and there was a certain way. They always walk up to it, and they do their feet a certain way. They do their hands a certain way. The, the whole body movement, everything they did was just a certain pattern of something, and they come up to the ball. They look one or two. The, whatever they did, they did the same every time. But you know what happened every time? Went in the cup. <laughs> I thought, why are they going through all these little nuances or something? Whatever was working for them, they figured it out somewhere along the way. And if it took, I mean, instead of just, now when I get out there, when you get out there, what do you do? You go, look once, look twice. Okay, plop. <laughs> in, the, in the sand trap, off the green on the other side. And then we try and get out and we hit it way on the other side or something. All I'm saying is when you look at a professional, they're doing it a lot. And they're doing it a certain way. How much more the church? How much more you and I? 
to apply God's word to make things habitual in a pattern of good works. Show yourself a pattern of good works. Paul wrote to Timothy. Don't let anyone despise your youth. That would be a good way for no one to be able to despise his youthfulness was because he would outshine them all because he was consistent. An article I read years ago, and we've applied it in our child rearing along the same vein. And all I remember is the title, but under each parts of this title were paragraphs or chapters. And it was entitled something to do with child rearing, and it said, Firm, fair, guess what the third one was? Consistent. Be firm, be fair, be consistent. Nothing more detrimental to a child in bringing up children in this world, especially in this day. You could be the first two and not have the last one. Well, any of them, they're all three essential ingredients. But can you imagine being firm, being fair, <clears throat> but not being consistent. The kids don't, they don't know how, you know what, they wake up every day or when mom or dad come in at that end of that day, they don't know what mood they will be in. They don't know how mom or dad are going to respond at any certain situation because they're not what? Consistent. So it's like, well, I want, and among themselves, they're probably saying, well, I wonder what mood, they call it what mood, Dad's going to be in, or Mom's going to be in. Wonder what mood the teacher's going to be in, or the Sunday school, or the pastor's going to You know, let's not think about moods. Let's think about him and let practice multiplying, subtracting, and bringing down the next. Get it so in us that, that we are just who we are. Even a child is known by his doings. So if we show inconsistency, if they do, we do, whatever, then we produce, everything produces after its kind. Whew. Now that puts a heavy on you, doesn't it? In that we want to get on course, stay on course, and do it, whatever we're doing, for the glory of God. And do it with frequency, doing it regularly, doing it in a consistent pattern. When they practice uh, running like the uh, relays, 440, anyone in track? When you were, not recently, but uh, younger maybe. I think one year I did for a little bit, but it wasn't my thing, but I did other sports mostly. And uh, the relay is very important that, and I'm saying this by way of our consistent presentation and what we do to reach the lost, being able to handle criticism, being, you know, I mean, we're flexible, but we're not, we're not going to bend over and give way to the enemy. We're going to be steady. We're going to be regular. We're going to be the same way. Good days are bad. And uh, they would practice this, really, and they'd have to do it a certain way. And here we are. The next generation's coming up, and they're the ones running behind us, and they're coming up the fourth runner, maybe. Or they, they would, well, I got that backwards. Anyway, you've got the two runners. One's waiting, and then you've got the one running, and as they're running, the one waiting, he's looking back, but only enough to know when to take off, and he starts running and once he starts running, he doesn't look back. He just runs, and he knows how many steps he's going to take, how to pick up speed. You know, this next generation, they're picking up speed. They've, and we just got to be running in sync to where it's practiced so much that that guy knows when to put his hand back. He's got a couple strides to put his hand back a certain way because if he looks back, He's going to get distracted. He's going, and you know what? They saw, call it getting out of stride. I want to be so consistent in what I'm doing that people look and say they can grab what we're offering because they see our consistency. We're in stride. 
So that next runner, they, they, don't, they know we're going to be there. They know, ready for the passing of the baton. We're going to have another fall festival. We're going to do another VBS, round the turn here. Well, those things, people will begin to look at our what? Consistency. What's, what they can count on. Can they rely? You know, there's a confidence that's built. There's a trust. Consistency, regularity builds confidence and trust. Children need that in child, children rearing. And adults, we're, those that are to be adults, <laughs> need to portray that, don't we? And in doing that, your witness, the weight of your words, when people seemingly are blowing you off, guess what? They're listening. I've had, have you ever had people quote you and you didn't even think they were, they were kind of walking through the room? He thought, how did they catch that? That was back when, wait a minute, they weren't even in my class. Or they weren't, in, and it's like, They'd be listening. <laughs> They'd be, you know, I see, kids are weird. Teachers will probably back me up on this. They can be goofing around, they're playing, they're doing something like this, and all of a sudden you think, I'm going to catch them. So, I, Hey, Timmy, what did I just say about such and such? And he'll quote you. <laughs> and you thought, well, he was listening. Oh, my gosh. Now, that's not always true. Would to God that was across the board. Everybody was really on it. But what gives you audience is this, you're not in a different mood. As seasons come and go, you're the same. People can count on you, this. But you must continue in the things which you have learned, knowing of whom you've received them. That continual thing, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this constancy, this will... It's in the midst of course corrections and God adjusting us. It might just be a time where he's forging and beating us into a shape. It's like, how did I get here? I don't know. It wasn't easy, but here I am by the grace of God. Paul said, Whew. you know, he couldn't take any praise or any accolades. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And yet his grace that was bestowed upon him, he said, was not in vain. He didn't want it to be in vain, all the grace that he received. You know what he did with all that he was given? He said, yet, with all of that, it wasn't like all God and thank you, Jesus, yet it caused him to labor more abundantly. And even in that laboring more abundantly that he did, he said, and yet, it, that wasn't even me, but the grace of God that was at work in me. I mean, he kept backing, dialing it back. It's God, it's God. But it caused me to give myself to that, to reach for that baton, to stretch that baton, on whatever end of the race he was on, to be, stay in sync with God, stay regular, consistent, because I see what God did continually for me and still continually does for me ever there as interceding and as intercession for us. I, God's been too good to me to change. One of the early, early uh, church fathers in church history and theologians as they look back on a man by the name of Polycarp. Not to go long into that one, but there's a lot of church history there. It, uh, church history seems to show that actually the Apostle John was one who laid hands on him and ordained him into ministry. So this was early, early church history. And uh, it was stated that at 86, he was called upon to recant and give over and deny his faith. He had Just his consistent stand had caused such pressure on the world as it was known at that time. They wanted to have nothing to do with him, and they drug him before a council, and he said, you know, you can deny your faith. We will leave you alone, but you must recant. Or suffer the consequences. And he said this. Well, for 86 years, God's been faithful to me. He's been good to me. He's been true to his word. How can I not do the same? I can't. 
I just, no, none. Now he paid a price. They burned him at the stake. Hallelujah. <laughs> but they said the power of God and the, that witness. Well, we talk about it. It's, he's in church history as one of those early martyrs. But I'm telling you that this is how the church was built. This is how the church is maintained. To be honest with you, in a lot of commercialized Christianity today, people can raise all kinds of monies for projects and special things. But if you put out a placard or you say something, uh, like, let's say, for the maintenance of the church <laughs> or to cover um, just a certain uh, regular need, people don't always... Now, this church, you guys, we're all different. You guys do give that way, but I'm saying, by and large, people need a big project, you know, some, some place to sow into that's a specific thing. And I'm very thankful for that, that when we do that, people give. But you know what? There has to be a place that's maintained for that to happen. And so you've caught that, but that's the key, is the maintenance, the continuance the line upon line, precept upon precept. I say that because there will be days that will get hotter than this. There will be days that where other troubles come and go. You already, I saw by the nods of heads or the lifting of hands that this week wasn't just Lake Placid. It was whoosh, wee, oh yeah. I had a couple days of it. My body feels it right now. <laughs> Standing here. When you get up in years, all your body parts grow mouths. I thought God only gave us one, but I found different. <laughs> it's like, shut up down there over there. Hey, quiet. <laughs> you know, I'm not 20 any longer. And so we can only do what, but being consistent. There cannot be enough said. It puts so much pressure on the devil. <laughs> it just, because here's what happens. When they hit a brick wall, when disaster shows up, when tr it's trauma, it's a 911. After they made that call, who do they call? I'm looking at them, aren't I? They get on the phone to grandma, grandpa, uncle so and so, aunt so and so. Somebody that they know knows how to pray. Praise the Lord. Speaking of prayer, we're just hitting it on Wednesday nights. Amen. We're getting ready to also uh, do a hosting of another guest speaker. Uh, it looks like, doc, I keep wanting to call him doctor, and he, he probably is, but he's known by Bishop Duku. Uh, and we mentioned the fellowship meal in September. Wasn't it the 18th, right? That's when he's coming, so perfect. So Bishop Duku will be here. Uh, we've just been in contact this week, so letting I see all the phones come out and the calendars go. Yeah. So that's so I wanted to convey that to you. So uh, he will be in the states uh, during that time and will be paying us a visit here and ministering. So that'll be exciting. And uh, what we find with the various ministries everywhere, th they just like Paul said, whether I or an angel from heaven, come and preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. This is the word of truth. This is where we hold the line. And how we hold it is we make sure our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We walk with the breastplate of righteousness and the girdle of truth, that we extend the sword of the Spirit. Now, in situations, uh, let the Spirit of God guide you. There are some situations where that arise that it's of necessity that I speak. And other times, God says, bite your tongue. I said, but it's not, doesn't matter if it, sometimes it's not right, and God just says, stop. So you have to obey the Spirit of God. One, one way is right, next time it might be a little differently. That can happen. But you hold the line on what you know to be, yes and amen, God's Word. Isn't that good? Because God's... He's going to confirm his word, not mine. <laughs> he'll, he'll always confirm his. He, he, does, he doesn't have to come up and back you or me up just because the way we look or how we, you know. Um, 
who we think we are, but God will be faithful to his word. Uh, I mentioned Bishop Duku just now. Also, your dad, has he left yet or is that coming real soon? I'm speaking of Rachel's dad, Dave. What is it? Okay, I, and I thought of that as I mentioned it. I think it's an act- Okay, yes. Yeah, so we'll keep you posted on that, but he asked the church to be praying for him. He's going to return trip back to the Philippines for kind of extended, what is it? Oh, why do I keep thinking it's the Philippines? Sorry, Indonesia. Now, see, I just repented and recanted, and because I was wrong. It's a course correction. I needed adjusted, so I... I can do that. <laughs> Good, thank you. Indonesia. So um, for weeks, I forget how many, but seven. Okay, I thought it was like a couple months or thereabouts. So seven weeks. So we'll be in uh, prayer for that trip. Uh, just him flying solo, but he'll be with many other people. Uh, those are challenges. Uh, just getting there and coming back, that's a very long, long trip. I don't know, it's like a whole day in a plane or different planes. Uh, so, so a lot to cover in prayer, to be thankful for, be consistent with, and, uh, and believing that as we come into this season of our life, though our seasons change, that God's word comes across straight through us, and people know us to be always the same. And I believe that of you, that when other people see you, they know where they can count on you. And that is valuable. I'm so thankful for that. So let's stand at this time. And I just want to bless you and ask that uh, God not just impart, but implant his word in you. And that uh, any place where uh, we felt him adjust that we we just say yes and amen lord we're going to stand by your word we're going to move by your spirit listening to you just as jesus did father jesus went about doing good healing all that were oppressed of the devil all that were sick came to him because they knew they could count on him and many in this community friends relatives but even people in the community that know us and some that don't know us very well we know that we are your torchbearers and we're a light shining in the darkness. So, Father, put a hedge about us and let us, within us, receive that implanted word that's able to save our souls but also be a light to others. We say yes and amen to your word. What you've committed unto us will be able to commit to faithful, continually consistent men and women as we pass the torch, pass the baton to the next generation, God, young and others beneath us, not beneath, but beyond us, they, they will look to us. And God, may we always give them our first and our best, just like we do for you. We will withhold no good thing, just as you withhold no good thing from them who walk uprightly. Father, help us in these endeavors, not to waver, but to be Firm, fair, and consistent. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for impartation today. Thank you for the joy of the Lord that strengthens us. Thank you for the doors opening wide during the, these next weeks, Father. Paul spoke of doors, great doors of opportunity that opened to him. But in the same verse, he said, and yet there were many adversaries. So both can happen at the same time. Lord, may we be prepared uh, and knowing the cure for criticism and this buffeting and stuff like that will be our consistency because we're looking at you who has been consistent and regular and faithful with us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, mighty God. I just speak your blessing over this house. Let the weak say they're strong. Let the healed, the, uh, uh, let everyone in the house declare that they are healed by the word of God and strengthened with might in their inner man. Hallelujah. We declare it today, Father. Declare it over our bodies, over our minds, over our emotions. Father, to our households, our children, those that are facing uh, troubles and sickness. In Jesus' name, 
We stand in the gap for one another and ask that your word run quickly to those areas and bring deliverance and healing in Jesus' name. And we be prepared on every turn to give an answer of the reason of the hope that's within us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Look for those opportunities. Amen. And then unload. No, <laughs> just give them. Yeah, don't just give them it all at once in five minutes. Hold still. I got more to say. No, <laughs> be a blessing.